Past Horrors Make Future Problems by Debbie Blue. There was a child wandering around the agency, eyes full of wonder as he explored and was the current source of Kunikita's building headache. Lord, Kunikita did not have the strength to deal with this, yet he resigned himself to the fact that this situation was now the agency's top priority, more accurately, top problem. It was Dazai's fault per usual. Dazai, the idiot, had consumed a pastry offered to him on the streets that just so happened to be imbued with an ability, an ability that de-aged its victims. Because the ability was cast on the food, Dazai wasn't able to nullify it. And now, 23-year-old Dazai was gone, and a small boy was in his place. Kunikita wouldn't be surprised if Dazai ate that on purpose, knowing what would happen because the prospect of driving Kunikita insane excited him. This could throw off his schedule for weeks depending on how long the ability lasted. Hopefully, the mini version of his partner wouldn't be so much of a nuisance. Dazai, how old are you? Kunikita asked. The boy, who was facing away from Kunikita, didn't respond. Kunikita called his name again. And again. He didn't respond. Guess he wouldn't be lucky. Kid Dazai was a pain in the ass, too. Don't ignore me, Dazai! At that, Dazai turned around and blinked at him owlishly. Who's Dazai? Kunikita looked over at Yosuno. She, along with the rest of the agency, were trying to decipher their shrunken co-worker. Her eyes briefly met Kunikita's, and she shrugged. She didn't know either. It was foolish of Kunikita to think she would be more informed than him. Yet, he'd hoped. Why wouldn't Dazai know his own name? Surely he didn't have a different one. That would be preposterous. And even if he did, it would have been in his file. Kunikita scoffed at that line of thought. Dazai's file was practically blank. As always, his identity and secrets were kept close to his chest. And as always, it came back to bite him all in the ass. You're Dazai, Atsushi chimed in. Dazai tilted his head and frowned. No. God damn it, Dazai. What's your name then, non-Dazai? Kunikita asked, growing more and more irritated by every second he spent with this child. None of this would be so confusing if Dazai hadn't lied to them. Apparently, Kunikita was too forceful with his words because Dazai flinched and withered, trying to make himself as small as possible. Dazai fiddled with his thumbs before murmuring his answer. Shuji. Huh. Kunikita hadn't expected his loudmouthed bastard of a partner to be a shy, quiet child. Yosuno crouched in front of him. She smiled when he peeked through his bangs to look at her. How old are you, Suji? Yosuno asked, repeating Kunikita's previous question, but in a more friendly, non-demanding manner. Child Dazai understandably seemed more receptive to her than to Kunikita. Ten. Ten? He appeared younger than that, given how small he was. Kunikita wondered if it was due to nature or nurture, or maybe both. Excuse me, ma'am, Suji said softly. Am I supposed to recognize you? No. You probably wouldn't, but we're friends. He nodded. His eyes left Yosuno as he continued the earlier task of looking around the room, even venturing further into the office and scanning the desks and the objects on them. The agency members smiled at him when his gaze crossed theirs. He returned the smile, although it was much smaller and much more hesitant. Kunikita, call Nakahara and inform him of the situation, Rempo said, as his hand dug around in the bag of chips he was holding. Nakahara, why? Now would be best, Kunikita-kun. There was an urgency in Rempo's voice that Kunikita rarely heard. This situation shouldn't have warranted such severity, but Kunikita trusted his co-worker. His phone was pulled out and pressed to his ear in mere moments. What the hell do you want? I'm busy, Chia growled. Great. Now he had to deal with a pissed-off Nakahara, too. It seems like the past partners were trying to make his day hell, but Kunikita was professional. He pushed down his displeasure. There's a situation Rampo-san believes you should be notified of, Kunikita said, voice plain and level. Well, spit it out! At least he tried to be polite, unlike the mafioso on the other end of the line. Although Kunikita shouldn't have expected someone as vile as Nakahara to be well-mannered, Dazai has been de-aged by an ability, and how old is he? Chia said, completely cutting Kunikita off without a care. He sounded as serious as Rampo had. Ten. Shit, Chia cursed. There was a commotion on the other end, and it sounded like Chia was running. Don't take your eyes off him, and don't let him touch you. I'm on my way. The call ended. Kunikita stared at his phone in confusion, then glanced at Shuji. There was a timid smile on his lips, and he was slightly rocking on his heels as he talked to Yosuno and Tanizaki. So much fret over a harmless child. He was actually kind of cute. The clock struck the hour, and Shuji moved. 
He charged at Kinji first. Shuji was in front of him before any of them realized something was happening. Silently and swiftly, his fingers stabbed Kinji's body until he crumpled to the ground. The pressure points hit with perfect accuracy and making Kinji unable to control his own body. It all happened so fast. No one had time to react. But when he pulled the gun out and pointed it right at defenseless Kinji's head, they all were sprinting. Where had he even gotten the weapon? Atsushi, being the fastest, was the first to get to the pair. His tiger paw wrapped around the gun, though his ability disappeared when his hand touched Shuji's. Atsushi grasped the gun tightly as he pushed it up and right as it fired. A loud bang echoed the room as the bullet went through Atsushi's hand, making the were-tiger hiss in pain. Kunikita stared at Shuji. His face was vacant of the small boy they'd been interacting with just moments prior. Now, his eyes were dark and sharp as he observed every detail around him and reacted accordingly. Kunikita's stomach lurched when he saw Shuji's lips curl up at the sight of Atsushi's now bloody hand. Whatever the hell was happening with his de-aged partner needed to be stopped immediately. Kunikita reached for his notebook, but it was gone. He patted himself down semi-frantically. It was always in the same place, but now he was left defenseless. Shuji's coat flared up as he jumped at Atsushi, and Kunikita spotted the notebook in one of the inner coat pockets. When had he stolen it off Kunikita? The kid hadn't been close enough to pull it away, nor did Kunikita see his hands move at any point. A thud pulled Kunikita back to the present issue. Atsushi had gotten tackled to the floor and was laying there with the smaller boy looming above him. Shuji put his foot on Atsushi's throat, pressing down as Atsushi choked. The boy smirked. Your guardian would have been proud. Tell me, do you enjoy hurting people as much as he did to you? I'm sure you picked up a few tactics from him now. Atsushi froze. Kunikita's jaw went slack. There was no way Shuji could know that. It was something Atsushi didn't talk much about that, and he was sure Atsushi hadn't told younger Dazai that. A glance at Yosuno ensured that he wasn't the only one shocked, but it done the damage intended. Atsushi lay still on the ground as if his limbs were tied down. A ghostly color appeared on his face. Shuji rolled out of the way right as Demon Snow lunged for him. Stay away from him, Kyoka said in her usual calm voice, but her face showed nothing but protective fury. Demon Snow attacked again with Kyoka's dagger in her hand, and this time managed to slash Shuji's cheek before disappearing when Shuji touched her. He didn't react to the wound other than tilting his head as if he were confused. Aren't you a brave one, using your ability after it's turned on you? Kyoka's eyes went wide before narrowing in anger. Shuji smiled. He'd found an inn. You don't know anything, she said, as Demon Snow prepared for another attack. It's betrayed you before, hurt the people you love. He walked toward her without an ounce of fear. Despite the strength she tried to admit, it was clear his words were a hard blow. The demon stopped right in front of her. Neither Demon Snow nor Kyoka attacked. He leaned in to whisper in her ear. It could be him next. Do you want to murder another person? Especially one who's done so much for you. She gasped, and it took Kunikita a moment to realize it wasn't from what he was saying, but from the knife, her own knife, stabbed through her stomach. Shuji pushed it deeper. She stumbled. The vicious boy didn't waste the opportunity to grab her by the hair and bring her face into his knee before dropping her to the floor. It was sheer luck she didn't land on the knife and impaled herself more. Kunikita ran to her side. Who knows how much damage Shuji had actually done to her. The door to the office was thrown open so violently Kunikita startled and instinctively held Kyoka tighter. Chuyu was standing there, hair a little askew and breathing a little heavier than normal, but otherwise fine. Shuji, that's enough! Chuyu yelled as he walked right into the fold of Shuji's destruction. His black eyes examined Chuya, who did nothing but square his shoulders. Dominant, confident posture, not faltering for a second. I am ordering you to cease your mission. Shuji's eyes went wide and innocent as he blinked at Chuya and grinned. He stepped closer to the gravity manipulator. Chuya took a step forward as well, not hesitating to match the younger's energy. Then Shuji laughed. The laugh you would find in a child watching a funny movie. Why would I listen to you, he asked as he giggled. You're just a number. He choked as Chuya grabbed his throat and used it to slam him to the floor. You're a cocky little shit, Chuya said, voice low in annoyance as he stepped on Shuji's back and grabbed his arms in a firm hold. He forced them together, then dropped down placing his foot on Shuji's back with his knee. The violent boy didn't seem to care. He stayed relaxed and didn't fight to escape. Susha Shuji, you're done. At that, the assailant thrashed as Chia transferred his grip to hold the former partner's wrists with one hand and pushed the boy's head hard against the ground with the other. There was a small, likely involuntary grunt at the added pressure against his cheek. Ironically, 
His mouth stayed shut. Shuya pulled Shuji's wrists up to create an uncomfortable tension in his shoulders. A flash of guilt crossed Shuya's face before it settled into hardness again. You will be disciplined should you ignore my command. I'm sure the dogs would love to see you again. There was a tense silence before Shuji grumbled. Acknowledged. You will not attempt to hurt or kill anyone unless I give you the order. Acknowledged. You will not purposely cause distortion. Shuji's eyes squeezed shut when Shuya bent his shoulders so far back it was painful. When he continued to stay silent, Shuya pushed until he heard a pop. A small gasp filled the room, and Shuji's body went rigid as the pain of his now dislocated shoulder flared and made its presence known, only getting worse when Shuya kept his arms in the same position. You will not purposely cause distortion! Acknowledged. Shuya nodded and let Shuji's arms go. He put one of the boy's arms down by his side and held the other in both hands, then moved off the boy's back to sit next to him. In small motions, Chia rotated Shuji's arm in circles until the bone popped back into place. His ex-partner's fingers twitched, but nothing more. Chia repeated the process with the other side, then stood. In an act of submission and acknowledgement of Chia's power over him, Shuji stood as well and stepped into place behind the mafioso, rolling his shoulders before they fell still at his side. His head stayed obediently down. Chia looked over his shoulder at the boy, seemingly making sure the boy was following proper protocol, and once he was satisfied with what he saw, he turned to Kunikita. Everyone's gonna live? Y yes Nakahara. What? Good. You need to find out how long this will last. He'll be in my care until this problem is resolved. Kunikita nodded, eyes glued to Shuji, worried he'd attack again. Chia headed out the door without giving Shuji any attention. Yet, the DH detective trailed by his side like a shadow, not looking back once at the carnage he'd caused. Once they got back to his apartment, Shuji asked, Are you injured? Other than his shoulders was implied. Shuji wordlessly shook his head. Their coats along with Chuya's hat were dropped on the hat rack. Let's get you some ice for your shoulders. Chuya headed deeper into the apartment, towards the kitchen. His steps faltered when he didn't hear Shuji accompanying him. What did I do wrong, sir? Shuji asked as he stared at his toes, still in that perfectly obedient pose. Chia sighed and walked back over to kneel down in front of him. He brushed the bangs out of his eyes, thus forcing Shuji to look up and meet his gaze. Unconsciously, Shuji's shoulders slumped. There wasn't a hint of anger or disappointment in his handler's body language. In sharp contrast to earlier, the elder's expression was soft and calm. His handler's glove moved to cup his cheek, and he couldn't help but lean into it. You were doing what you thought was wanted of you, Shuji. You didn't do anything wrong, Chia said firmly. But I don't want you to go after any other ability users while you're with me. Shuji nodded in compliance at the strange order. Are you hungry? A shrug. How about I make crab? Shuji's eyes shot up and looked over at Chia. How did you... Chia just winked as he continued his previous objective of walking to the kitchen. The stool at the kitchen island was the perfect place to watch Chia work. So that's where Shuji sat. Yet, his confusion lingered. Sir, I still don't understand why you're rewarding me, Shuji muttered, his eyes following Chuya's now bare hands rather than giving the mafioso his full attention. They were weirdly soft for a weapon such as his handler to have, and every time the hands went to grab something, there was a millisecond of hesitation, as if Chuya was afraid of the power his bare hands held. That hesitation hadn't been there when the gloves were on. Did his gloves restrain his powers? It must have been a mental restraint rather than a physical one. Why would his handler want to make himself weaker? No, Chia didn't see it as weakness. He saw it as a precaution. Caution, because he cared. It was in his touch, even through gloved hands and in his eyes. He was comfortable around Shuji. Not a single tense muscle despite knowing how dangerous the boy was, which implied, The food isn't a reward, Shuji. It's something everyone deserves, no matter behavior. I'll never starve you like those monsters did and call me Chia. He was a good person, a weak person. People like him, those that protected and loved, didn't survive. Shuji stored that information in the back of his mind. For now, he didn't want to hurt Chia. He was nice and hadn't punished Shuji despite clearly being disappointed with his previous behavior. And Chia was making his favorite food, something his handlers had only done once after his first kill. You're different than my usual handlers. The boy's voice was neutral and low. I'm sure you won't last long. Shuya's lips turned up, though it seemed sorrowful. I don't want you to worry about that, okay? Shuji chose silence and watched Chia cook. 
It was strange how Chuya didn't seem to mind his observant, creepy, as he'd called it in the past, nature. He was too confident and comfortable around Shuji. It could be because he believed in his own power, but Shuji had a feeling that wasn't it. Have we met before? Shuji asked. Not at this stage in your life, no. At this stage in his life? So, the past, not the future? That wasn't possible, was it? Shuji glanced at Chuya's satisfied expression. Chuya had worded it as a puzzle on purpose, one he knew would keep Shuji occupied, one that would encourage the Kinesic to look around and explore more of their environment. But Shuji didn't want to leave Chuya. He was too interesting. Shuji put his arms on the table and rested his chin on top of them. His eyes roamed every inch of Chuya, and occasionally their surroundings. Did the organization wipe his memory of Chuya at some point? Hence, they technically have not met. He wouldn't have been surprised. It was frustrating that he was struggling to figure out his handler's wording. Already, Shuji, come sit. They sat at the table with a few words exchanged between them, and the rest of the night followed in a similar fashion. Through the night, Chuya's behavior never grew more understandable to Shuji. He would look up from what he was doing and see the observer staring at him, then go back to whatever he was doing, as if being constantly watched by Shuji specifically didn't bother him or wasn't new to him. All of his weakness laid out for Shuji to read, yet his handler was at ease. Worst of all, Shuji felt safe with him, from his body language to his words to his actions. Shuya radiated strength, yet affection, for Shuji. The ten-year-old had never been more confused in his life and decided Nakahara Chiyo was an enigma he would dedicate his life to solving. It's been a long day. Let's turn in for the night. I can still operate, sir, Shuji said quickly. No matter how nice Chiyo was, Shuji knew what was expected of him. Chiyo patted his head and led him to the guest room. The bed was bigger than one Shuji had ever slept in. He wondered why Chiyo would waste such non-essentials on him. All I want you to do is rest. I'm one room over if you need me. He'd exposed where he was sleeping next to Shuji. I could kill you in your sleep, he blurted out. Why had he said that? Why did he reveal vital information he knew to Chuya? He was being stupid. But Chuya just chuckled, understanding the position Shuji had just put himself in. Going soft on me, Shuji? Shuji's cheeks flushed as he shook his head. No, sir. I thought I told you to call me Chuya. You did, sir. Chuya? Chuya pointed to the closet. There are extra clothes in there and a toothbrush and toothpaste in the restroom. When you finish, you will go to bed. Yes, Chuya. Good night, Shuji. The boy bowed his head before Chuya exited the room, leaving the boy alone with thousands of thoughts. Despite the way his mind raced, the bed ended up being more powerful and lulled him to sleep. Chuya woke up the next morning to a phone call. He stretched over to grab the phone off the nightstand. Is there a reason you're calling me at 9 a.m.? We have information on the ability user. Kunikita said. Well, that was a pretty good reason. Chia unwillingly dragged his body to sit on the side of the bed. I'll be at your agency in an hour. Kunikita cleared his throat awkwardly. Are you bringing him? Chia rolled his eyes at the wariness. No one had even died or got too badly hurt. Yes, Kunikita. I can't exactly leave him alone, can I? Kunikita reluctantly agreed, as if he had a choice before they ended the call. Chia made his way to the guest room. When he pushed open the door, he saw Shuji sitting on the side of the bed, hands folded in his lap and staring at the wall. He didn't look at Shuya when he entered the room, as protocol dictated. Good morning, Shuji. The phrase was repeated back to him mechanically, still looking at the wall, waiting for permission to break his form. Here came the hard part. Shuya knew his current charge wouldn't react well to this. Get dressed and go to the kitchen once you're done. We have an errand to run. Training? No, Shuji. The people in the office from yesterday have information we need, so we'll be going there. Shuji's head whipped to him. He scurried off the bed to his feet, eyes wide and scared. You're not with the organization. They would never order me to go back to a mission site where the targets were still alive. Who are you? Shuji put his hands up and kept himself as relaxed as possible. Dealing with a feral animal would have been easier. Shuji, it's all right. I'm not going to hurt you. The assassin glared at Shuji and jumped at him, going for the attack. He kicked Chuya's right ankle, one of the weakest points in his body given how many times he'd broken it, making Chuya stagger but not fall. Once Chuya was off balance, Shuji aimed a punch right at his throat. What he wasn't expecting was for Chuya to predict this and catch his fist. Chuya yanked Shuji close to him, spinning him so that his back was to Chuya, and pinned both of his arms across his chest, trapping him in place. This is all you're good for, Shuji hissed. 
you're just a weapon for everyone around you to use and then throw away. No one stays with you because they don't see you as human. But you know that. That's why... Chuya slapped a hand over Shuji's mouth and held firm as the violent boy thrashed. God, you really are a fucker at any age. Shuji, the organization isn't coming after you. Chuya winced when Shuji bit his hand. That's it, Chuya snapped. He dragged Shuji out of the room into his own. The boy struggled to free himself the entire way there. When the bed was in sight, Shuji was shoved onto it. Shuya put one of the picture frames that was on his nightstand in Shuji's face. Shuji looked at the picture, and then the fight died in him as he stared at it. This is you, Chuya said. The photo showed Chuya laughing at Dazai, who was covered in whipped cream, but Dazai was smirking because he had a can of whipped cream over Chuya's head, finger on the nozzle, and clearly moments away from pressing it. Shuji took the picture from Chuya and traced it with his hand. That's me, he whispered. I'm so old. Chuya sat next to him. You were hit by an ability that de-aged you. In the present, you're 23. I'm still alive? Chuya nodded. Oh, Shuji murmured. I didn't think I'd make it that long. You never wanted to, Chuya said knowingly. Shuji shrugged, but his hands tightened on the picture frame. There are still times when Dazai, the name you go by now, still feels that way too. But it's better. How? You're no longer with the organization, for one. You haven't been since you were twelve, Chuya said. The younger scoffed disbelievingly. It's true, Chuji. That office we were at yesterday was where you work. I work in an office job, Shuji said with a slight chuckle. Do you work there too? No. We met before you started working there. We used to work together, though. We were partners and everything. And now? Now we're kind of different partners. Shuji blushed, and Chuya couldn't help but laugh. I need more proof. Chuji said hesitantly. So they spent the next hour going through photos and memorabilia in the living room. There was a lot to look at. Future me takes lots of photos, Shuji murmured as he went through stack after stack. Chuya was laying on his stomach on the floor next to Shuji, yet again showing no fear and not hesitating to put himself in a vulnerable position in front of the boy. He takes photos to remind himself why he wants to live, when he can't remember on his own. Shuji hummed, biting back a smile. Some of the photos were of people in the office he saw yesterday. There were a few photos of people he didn't recognize, too. But the large majority of the photos were of Chuya, or the duo together. But Shuji knew how difficult he was. He knew it was something that would never go away, and no matter where he was, or who he was with. Yet, here Chuya was. And there Chuya had been since they were fifteen, apparently. You stay with me? Why? Because you would jump off a bridge without me, Chuya muttered. Shuji snorted at the words. Chuya thought about it for a moment, looking at the photos and picking up a few as he did. Future you is an annoying pain in my ass, but he's trying. He's always trying. And he protects me more than anyone else has. You love him. Do you love me? Chuya's cheeks dusted pink, but he nodded. If future me trusts you, then I trust you too. Shuji sucked in a breath. I'll go get ready so we can go to the office. Chuya's lips turned up, and Shuji could see that he was pleased and relieved with Shuji's decision. Because it was a decision, Chuya wouldn't make him go to the office if he declined. The boy stood and started to walk down the hallway, but paused. Chuya? Hmm? Shuji chewed on his lip, fumbling for the words he wanted to say, yet Chuya knew. It seems like he always knew what to do or say when it came to Shuji. For the first time, that wasn't such a scary thing. I won't let anything happen to you, Shuji. Chuya said. With that promise, Shuji nodded and went to change. By the time they go to the agency building, it was late afternoon. Shuji was clinging to Chuya's coat as they walked in, barely managing to not trip. He was admittedly not feeling brave at that moment. It didn't help that the entire agency was watching their every move cautiously from the second they stepped through the door. He knew they were furious with him, but also scared, which wasn't a good combination. Angry people hurt. Scared people lash out and that was the majority of what he was reading in the room, Chuya being the exception. Nakahara, Kunikita greeted, his expression sour. You're late. I got caught up. Kunikita's eyes met Shuji's, making the boy flinch. Pure bitterness and rage filled the man's eyes. Shuji pressed himself as close to Chuya as he could. True, most of it was faked fear. However, some of it wasn't. He didn't like this, and he didn't want to be here with these people. Chia patted his head in reassurance. It's all right, Shuji. 
Shuji nodded uncertainly, focused on Shuya. Focused on Shuya's shoulders, set back and his head tilted up, fearless in front of the people surrounding them. Focus on his hand slightly tensed on the side Shuji was on, ready to grab the younger, or stop the threat. Focus on his stance, and how he was unconsciously and barely noticeably keeping himself between the agency members and Shuji. Focus on Chuya's protection. He'd protect Shuji, or die trying. Why is he acting all afraid when he's the one attacking us? Kunukita grumbled. Shuji should have killed Kunukita when he could. Even though this man wasn't the real threat to Shuji, he was bothersome as hell. Glasses, that naive idiot, assumed every child was precious and innocent. Shuji could slash his allies' necks, and he would still hesitate to hurt Shuji due to his age. How pathetic. Shuji's fist shook as his face screwed up, but he stayed by Chuya's side rather than going after the man like he wanted to. Chuya wouldn't be happy about that, and he deserved Shuji's obedience and loyalty. Chuya ignored Kunikita's words, continuing his own agenda. You have the information? Kunikita nodded, leading them to the couches. Almost all of the agency members followed, trapping them in the small space. It was suffocating, and Shuji went willingly when Chuya sat and pulled him down to his side. A quick glance around the room confirmed that their doctor had healed everyone's injuries, as he assumed she would should they have lived through his original assault. Still, it was slightly frustrating to see all traces of his hard work gone. He should have gone for her second. It was foolish to save the healer for one of his later targets. He was trained better than his performance yesterday. Not even one person had died. The ability can't be cancelled out. However, it supposedly ends the second midnight after the ability takes effect, Kunikita explained to Chuya. Yet, he kept looking at Shuji. He glared at him, never taking a submissive position, despite feeling uncomfortable with all the attention, especially in this situation. Their eyes stayed locked until Kunikita looked away, shifting to Chuya instead. Unshockingly, the spineless man had lost a battle of wills. As his eyes danced from person to person, taking in every detail and turning it into information, he wondered what his future self was thinking when he decided to work with these people. How could he possibly align himself with such inadequacy? Shuji's seen toddlers with more mental forte than them. Physical strength was nothing compared to their mental weakness. Their punches wouldn't save them, as Shuji demonstrated yesterday. There was only one person in this office Shuji was vigilant of. The man with the spiky black hair, wearing that ugly brown hat. Rompo. Rompo had known to call Chuyo when Shuji had done nothing to invoke suspicion. Rompo had known Shuji was dangerous, which meant one thing. He could read Shuji as well as Shuji could read all of them. And that was dangerous, more than anything else. Despite their rivaled intelligence, Rompo would be the last person Shuji took down. For one, he was physically weak. They both knew he didn't stand a chance against Shuji's prowess. And second, he was the most valuable person in the office. Kunikita, Yosuno, and Atsushi, the main competent fighters, all displayed protective body language towards Rompo and admiration for him. He was important and needed protecting. The fighters would push back whatever mental torment they were facing due to Shuji's words to keep him safe. Trying to take him out when the others were still capable of fighting was a death sentence. Said man was looking at Shuji with a knowing smirk on his face. What an arrogant asshole, yet one Shuji begrudgingly respected. Intelligence recognizes intelligence. Shuji huffed and looked away. So he'll revert back to 23 tonight, she asked to confirm. That's correct. Kunikita cleared his throat, and Shuji internally groaned. These people were so entitled. Nakahara. The other agency members and I would like an explanation of yesterday's events. Chia, consistent with his behavior over the last 24 hours, glanced at Shuji for permission. It was refreshing to be treated like an actual person, not a child, not a weapon, just a person who lived and breathed and had opinions. Shuji nodded. Sharing this information would affect future him, Dazai, but Shuji didn't care. The backlash wasn't his problem to deal with. And besides, Shuji was curious to know how much of his past Chia knew. Dazai was taken by a mercenary organization when he was seven. They trained him to be an assassin, especially for ability users due to his nullification. Although he was born with most of his intelligence, they further trained him in the art of manipulation, mainly learning to put together a person's entire life based on body cues and behavior. So that's why he attacked us? How do you get him to stop? Kunikita asked. He's so docile now. Oh. Oh, he did not. Shuya grabbed Shuji's collar and yanked him back down right as he made a move to lunge at Kunikita. Shuji almost laughed when Kunikita flinched. Say that again and you'll see exactly how docile I am. 
Shuji seethed. Shuji, Chuya warned lightly. I know. Shuji muttered as he crossed his arms. No killing or maiming. A shame, really. He should have tried to change Chuya's mind on that. The hand holding the back of his shirt let go, trusting he wouldn't disobey. To answer your question, I have extensive knowledge on Dazai's past. This answer wasn't the one Kunikita wanted to hear. In fact, Shuji watched Kunikita's form grow tenser at the answer. Dazai sure trusts you a lot, Kunikita said suspiciously, as if he was someone future Shuji should trust. What a joke. Shuji had seen enough in the last ten minutes to know exactly why Kunikita, and by extension the agency, didn't know much about him. Chuya seemed just as tired and understanding as Chuji. There was trained patience in his voice when he answered. Daze and I used to be partners. Ah, so future him's relationship with Chuya was a secret. Wise decision on their part. These people shouldn't be trusted with such pertinent information. Yet, Dazai has withheld this information from the agency. I've been his partner for three years, Kunikita growled. Bad move, glasses. Shuji saw the shift in Chuya, how his eyes turned hard and his posture stiff. He wasn't just getting mad, but safeguarding as well. Things were finally getting interesting. Maybe he'd see Chuya use his ability. He knew it was a powerful one, and had to do with balance and weight. The way Chuya put the exact same pressure on the floor every time his foot came down when he walked casually. The changes in how loud his steps were depending on his mood. The way he reached for heavy things that he had to get on his tippy toes to reach and never struggled to grab it or adjust the weight despite the unnatural holding position. It could be ballet or sheer muscle, but Shuji doubted it. His bet was that Chuya's ability was closely involved with gravity. Shuji was dying to confirm his theory. He doesn't owe you shit, Chuya said darkly. What's between Daza and I stays between Daza and I. Whatever I know doesn't go back to the Mafia, if that's what you're worried about, Kunikita. And this time, the change was in Kunikita. From the twitch of his eyebrows to the slight tilt of his head, Kunikita's body cues screamed that he was suspicious. Are you implying that you have a relationship with him outside of work? Ah, so maybe Glasses wasn't completely useless. Good for him. Chuya, Shuji was quickly learning, did not have defensive reactions. Not to things where defense, rather than offense, would be the first instinct. He was the protector, through and through, never the one hiding behind someone or submitting to a superior opponent. The mafioso's chest puffed out to a degree that even Shuji barely caught while one of his legs, the one next to Shuji, turned outwards, expanding the space he took up and thus increasing the dominance in his position. Now, his knee was brushing up against Shuji's, making a subtle claim over him. There was a sharp edge to his voice when Chuya spoke. I don't see how that concerns you. Thank you for the information. Shuji, let's go. Chuya stood and Shuji happily followed. Chuya waited for Shuji to walk past him before walking out of the space, never letting Shuji out of his eyesight in the presence of the agency members. Nakahara, this isn't over. Piss off, Kudakita, Chuya hollered as he and Shuji stepped out of the office. The door closed behind them. What a piece of work. The sun was setting when they exited the building. They started to walk home. So much had happened in the last two days. There were so many things to think about, so many questions, and so many things Shuji wanted to say. Hey, Chuya? Yeah? I'm glad I found you. When Shuji looked up, he saw a warm, fond smile on Chuya's lips. I'm glad I found you too, Shuji.